Studio 2 at Abbey Road is considered to be one of the most important recording studios in music history. This studio has been the site of countless iconic recordings, including many of the Beatles' most famous albums. Its advanced technology, innovative design, and unique acoustics allowed musicians to experiment with new sounds and techniques, leading to the development of many groundbreaking genres and styles. Some of the iconic recordings to come out of Studio 2 include Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon, Radiohead's OK Computer, and countless others. But really why I'm here is because it's where the Beatles did most of their records. I came here once in 1994, but they wouldn't let me in the door. <laughs> now I've been invited. Here we are. Wow. Welcome to Studio Two. I finally made it. Yeah. Yeah, they don't make them like this anymore. Okay, so I figured that you could just walk up to Abbey Road Studios, oh, ring right, the okay. bell, and yeah, they would yeah, just yeah. let you in. Yeah, come on in. Yeah. And I was completely soaked. It was my first time I ever came to the, to the UK. Okay, well, of course, you got rained on then, yeah. Yeah, of course. <laughs> 1994, I come up to the door, I ring, ring the bell, and who are you? Are you here for a session? No. Oh. Can I just come in just for a second? No. So I finally made it. Yeah, we've got to be very careful who we let in. <laughs> well, no, welcome. I'm, I'm glad you finally made I, it. I appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. Great. This place has been here since, well, this studio has been here since the place opened in 1931. Yep. It, was, it was designed for more of the kind of popular music of the time. So kind of uh, Jack Hilton, Joe Loss, that sort of thing. Uh, like the swing bands. Um, and yeah, I mean, as with Studio One, Studio Three, studios weren't a thing back then, really. So yeah. they kind of, I wouldn't say they didn't know what they were doing, but it was, it's, acoustics is still a bit of a dark art, right? So it's, um, it was kind of early days there. So if anything, I think this room was a bit too bright. So they sort of, sort of started hanging these drapes down. But and they hung these drapes a long time ago, before pre Beatles. The yeah, yeah, the drapes were so. pre Beatles. I think they used to have like a curtain, they would sort of, drag across the room just to sort of deaden it down a bit. So I did not realize that it's actually painted brick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and the brick is kind of laid sideways as well to get thicker walls. So kind of, you know, trying I to noticed, keep sound coming in, or sound that. going out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yes, it's painted brick. That's and interesting. Painted brick, hard wall, hard floor. And how high <laughs> is the ceiling here, Merrick? Uh, that I don't know off the top of my head. But probably about three stories or yeah. so. Yeah. I mean, when most people think of what a recording studio looks like, this isn't kind of it, I guess. Yeah. Like, this is like a, a I was always shocked the time. when I saw Beatles photos that it was kind of a stark room yeah. until they started decorating it later on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That all those songs were recorded in this room that has white walls and... Yeah. It's, it's kind of, because like the room, the sound of the room is like really beautiful. Yeah. Um, it's like just a very satisfying room to record in. and. The moment like a, a band comes in, the room sort of develops a personality depending on you know where the band's set up. People find areas in the room they want to record in, and you start getting screens in. And by the time all the gears in here, you cut, the, the the session sort of develop adds a personality, additional personality to the room itself. So it's kind of quite interesting to watch that transition. Where do drummers usually set up? Is there a specific uh, spot? Normally, um, normally on the back left hand side okay. or the back. Having said that, actually, I, I did a blog for um, Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds um, No More Shall We Part album, which I was the assistant engineer on. Yep. And I had to like jog my memory. I actually found a video on YouTube, and we actually the drums were actually set up in the in the middle of the room to the left there, which is I don't know why that happened even, but that's very rare. It, the, the drums normally team, tend to be at the back of the room um, because I guess that's where Ringo had his drums, so okay. it's just kind of stuck. So you saying back here in this back area? Back corner, yeah, if you look at most of the photographs from those sessions in the 60s, the drums tended to be back here in the left-hand side, yeah. I mean, this is an enormous room to, to record a rock band. Yeah, I mean, look, you're not gonna get much isolation in this room. Well, you right. certainly didn't then. We've got, actually got isolation booths now, but they're only 
added like about three or four years ago. But I think in the late 50s, they added these massive swing out screens okay. to try and divide the room yeah. up a little bit. But would, still, would, they have, would they have gobos as well? Yeah, and gobos. But I mean, there's a limit to how much separation you're going to get. Right. But that's part of the sound, right? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. That's, that's a desirable thing sometimes. Yeah. Um, you know, everything's bleeding into each other and it creates like a thicker sound. And... Wow. Yeah, it's like about 1.6 reverb time. Um, I mean, it's, it doesn't sound as big as it looks. No, it doesn't. If that it's, makes it's, sense. It's, it's, it's drier yeah. than, than what I would have thought it would be. Yeah. Unlike Studio One, where you, you know, unless you're going after some like kind of very specific sound, you wouldn't do a band in Studio One. It'd be too right. big, too yeah. reverberant. It would be crazy. Um, and you wouldn't necessarily want to record where well, you couldn't physically record a orchestra in Studio Three, for example. But this room's kind of in the middle. You can kind of like, whatever you throw at this room, it just kind of works. So you guys do smaller ensembles Yeah, in yeah, here. smaller string sections are done here. A lot, a lot of um, uh, pop string overdubs were done here. Okay, you know, let's like, say if you went back to uh, Eleanor Rigby and they bring in a small group, yeah, would yeah. that be have done in here? Probably. Eleanor Rigby was done in here, yeah, okay. yeah. I mean, that's an amazing recording. I mean, it is. you it's know the recording, obviously, well but recording. They, um, it was very unusual at the time, but they wanted to get like a really, really intimate sound. And yeah. Jeff Emmerich like put the, uh, the KM54 uh, microphones like, like really close to the strings to the yeah. point where it like freaked the musicians out. They're like, what are you doing? Sort of right. Because people weren't used to that sort of thing, that experimentation of like, and they want to get like a really super dry sound, but it comes across, it's such a great sound. It does. I noticed though, a lot of these uh, orchestra recordings, Beatles, recordings, I Am The Walrus, for example, the sounds are so aggressive, the yeah. cello sounds, yeah. and that's probably yeah. from the close miking as well. Yeah, the close microphone technique, but also the preamps, like the Red 47 preamps, they yep. have quite a gritty sound. Yeah. So um, a lot of those Beatles recordings from say like 64 up until 68, they kind of got that sound to them, haven't they? Yeah. And then funnily enough, when Abbey Road was recorded in 1969, that went from valve to transistor, preamps and desks, and it has got a slightly more polished sort it of does. sound about. Yeah. Um, but that gritty sound you're talking about was definitely a combination of those old classic valve mics with the, with the Red 47 preamp. Well, they sound so modern, those the orchestral recordings today even, they're so aggressive sounding. They really have weathered the test of time. They sound absolutely amazing. Yeah, I mean, those, those tapes, those, those masters just sound incredible. Yeah. Um, I, mean, I had the privilege of assisting on the, um, the remixes for some John Lennon, um, well, all the John Lennon back catalogue, but also the Beatles anthology. We remixed it in 5.1 back in the early 2000s. Mm -hmm. and I had the privilege of, of listening to those multi-tracks, right? Okay. And it's just like, it's mind blowing to think that, um, like take, take a day in the life, for example, recorded on a four track tape machine. I mean, how complicated is that production, you know, to record that on four tracks. And you, yeah. you put the four tracks up and it sounds amazing. Um, and the way they achieved that was, it was this, this, this concept of bouncing down. Yeah. So they, they rec they'd fill up four tracks of one four track tape machine, bring in another four track tape machine, bounce those four tracks onto one track of the okay, second so tape what machine, went, and they'd what, layer up. Okay, so what did they do with those tapes that they, they, they bounced kept from? They yeah, kept they them kept all. They kept them all, yeah, yeah, well, luckily. I mean, which was unusual in itself. I yeah. mean, it's very common to keep the master tape, like right. the one you actually but do the actually final mix But to actually keep from. the ones that you bounced from yeah, is, I don't know, uh, was unusual. Yeah, I made that decision, and I'm glad they did, because subsequently, like Giles Martin has been able to go back and sync all those, all those tapes together to get an, an original multitrack, if you like. Like, uh, they wouldn't, see, this is the thing with like, Working back then on four track tape machines like that would have been a very committed way of recording. Yeah. Like if you decide on your final mix that the snare drum's too quiet, yeah. there was nothing you could do about that. Cause right. That would have been probably like three or four. Which is also why back. the tambourines are so loud. Yeah, they right. probably yeah, crank yeah, the yeah, high yeah, end because yeah. they know that would be happening later on. That that stuff would be be diminished and diminished. Yeah. I mean, it's a, psychologically, it must have been a very committed way of recording. Whereas now. You know, you've got hundreds of tracks. Right. You know, you put four, four tracks just for the snare drum. You know, no one's making a decision as such until the very last minute. Even in the mastering stage, people take stems now to mastering sessions. So you can make those decisions, you know, right through the production process. But back then, it was like, we're committing to this. This is it. There's no going back. So it was a different way of recording. Um, I'm not saying it was wrong or right, or today is wrong or right, but it's just a different way of doing things. In the beginning of the Beatles, uh, in the early 60s, what would be the mic selection? What would you have? You'd have U47s, yeah. you'd have U48s, you'd have... 
D D twenty. What would they have? D twenty on the kick drum normally. They have D nineteen was a really popular. That was a workhorse microphone. There used to be apparently like dozens of those mics here. We've got three left now. Okay. They're really delicate. Yeah. They're almost throwaway. They just like like okay D nineteen's fine. We've got through another load, but it's order more in. But now they're like gold dust. Yes. So they're so. Uh, what else? Um, the the Coles forty thirty eight was used a lot. C twelves, okay. a lot of the classics basically. Yeah. yeah, yeah. When they first started here, yeah, we talked about this a little earlier. There were rules that people had to follow. Yeah, I mean, if you if you look at Abbey Road, I mean, it's opened in nineteen thirty one. Yep. So back then it was predominantly classical music, and then the kind of the popular music of the time. So so. It wasn't amplified music. Right. Rock and roll didn't come to these shores till the mid '50s. Clip Richard and the Shadows, that yep. sort of thing. So when that happened, it was it was kind of seen as like a fad, right? Like this new amplified music. You know, it won't it won't last long. This, it, these are the execs I'm talking about here. Sure, like, you know, of some of the classical guys as well. I imagine would be a bit like that. Yeah. And it was the younger generation of engineers here who kind of learnt their craft from the classical engineers, uh, and also some of the um, the pop music of the time. But it still wasn't amplified. And they were kind of like adapting what they learned. So I'm talking about Malcolm Addy, Stuart Eltham, uh, Peter Baum, like the first generation of pop engineers here. Took what they adapted from those earlier sessions and, and adapted it to this kind of amplified music, this rock and roll music. Um, and there was concerns that you know amplification would damage, damage the rhythm the microphones. and the microphones. Yeah, yeah of all course. That sort of stuff. So there were Which rules, you could. but yeah. you know rules are there to be broken, right. right? And that's what they did. They just pushed their limits and. Uh, I think people got in trouble a lot, or people did things on the sly, but that's how you progress, right? The Beatles engineers would, they'd just be experimenting all the time, yeah, right? They yeah. want to do different, different things, and the guys in the Beatles too, I'm sure, wanted to have each song sound have its own original sound, and they would experiment really all over this building, as, yeah. we, as we talked about earlier. Yeah, it was a very experimental time. We had like uh, the Zombies, the Hollies recording in here, uh, Cliff Richards and the Shadows, um, but there, in reality, really though, time. In, the, in reality, some of these uh, time periods when you had help, you had Rubber Soul Revolver, they'd be, Beatles would make three records in one calendar year. So they must have been here all the time. Yeah, this was like their second home. Okay, so we have a bunch of wonderful microphones here that I've, I know some of them. Can you tell me about each one of these? Yeah, sure. So this is the EMI RM1B. Uh, EMI used to make their own microphones yep. back in the day. Oh, yeah. So um, when the studios first opened, it would have been Western Electric microphones and EMI made microphones. The German microphones didn't come onto the scene until later on. Uh, so this is one of them. Uh, I think How old only, is this mic? This is like 1949. Wow. Yeah. Nice. Um, so there's only like two of these in existence that we know of. Um, I think only 35 were ever made. This is number 34. Uh, so ribbon microphone. Um, uh, it's just got. A, it kind of looks like it's going to sound really lo-fi, but it doesn't. It sounds really rich and, and sort of quite wonderful. It's still got that kind of slightly archaic sound, but mm -hmm. it's, it's like got character that is quite wonderful. We use these actually on the, on the Spitfire sessions. We have them just at the front of the orchestra, so you kind of got that option for. And how many of these do you have? Sound. Only two of those. Two of those. Yes, yeah, so wow. I hope I hope one of they don't go down because if they do, my sessions are okay, ruined. Okay, I'm going you know? <laughs> to stay back there. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I just I just love the fact that these are still used. Um, and yeah, I'm glad they're still here and we still got them. And you know, people like well, Lester can look after these microphones and keep them going. You know, it's Lester who does all your mic maintenance, right? Yeah, Lester Smith. Yeah, he's been here a while and looks after all the microphones. And, and and talk about that about how it's hard to find people that really know how to work on these. Yeah, I mean, these mics, yeah, 1949, um, the U47s are actually, yeah, late 40s as well. Yeah. I mean, so yeah, I mean, these mics, it's one thing. Mics like U47s, though, are made, there's so many different versions of them now. These yeah. are the original these ones. These are the original, yeah. Right, but people have dissected these and know, many people know yeah. about these, how yeah. these are constructed. Yeah, yeah. The thing is, though, it's one thing owning this beautiful older, older equipment, it's one thing we have to look after it. Right. I mean, I guess if you've got enough money, Anyone can get hold of something Eric, like this, but you know you got to look after it. You know it's maintenance. The like tubes that. in these, how long do they last for? They can last for decades. Well, they right? can last for decades, but there is a bit of a problem. So the the actual original valve in the Neumann forty seven and forty eight. When he says valve, it means tube. <laughs> tube, sorry. Yeah. yeah. No, but valve. Yeah. Um, 
VF14s. Yes. Like, I think when these were these microphones were made, they were just going out of production. Those valves, right? So there's a problem to begin with. Yeah. Um, and over the years, people have found new old stock, like in warehouses or whatever. You just where you find this stuff is mind blowing sometimes. Right. But there is a limited supply. We've got a few of them, but once they're gone, they're gone. And yeah. a lot of people do say, and I believe them, the VF14 is the sound of, or is part of a huge part of the sound of, of the course. microphone. So once that goes, I mean, people have tried other valves over the time, um, but they just haven't quite got the same sound. It's one of those weird things, just the way it is, but we're all right for a while. Another Neumann classic, yep. this is the M50. Yep, um, there's the M49, there's the M50. Wait, yeah. what, is this, what is the difference between an M49 and M50? So the M49, funnily enough, was the more popular microphone here yes. at Abbey Road. It's now the reverse, but the M49 has got the, the switchable polar patterns. Yeah. Which I think at the time was like quite a like a big deal. That was like unusual. The That's right. Changed the patterns, so yes. you could go from omnidirectional picking up everything yep. to cardioid, just picking up at the front. Figure of eight, figure we eight. pick up the front and the back. Yep. So there are a lot of M49s at Abbey Road. We still got a few of them, but now we've got more M50s. Are M50s Omni? They're Omni. They've got yeah. a slightly darker side on 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 the back, but yeah. pretty much Omni. Yeah. Um, and these are mainly used as the, the decatry for recording orchestras, and the decatry yeah. goes back back to the. You probably 50s have a lot school. of these then, right? Yeah, we've got like 15 or so, I think. Yeah. When did these become more popular? When did it switch from the M49s to the M50s? Pretty around the 60s or 70s. Yeah, I and why did yeah. people realize? Why did people start to favor these? I think people just prefer that because they look the same, but they're actually quite different microphones. So they're the um, they got different um, capsules inside. Yeah. Um, different makeup, so they, they've got different sound. I think people just seem to gravitate towards the sound of the M50 for omnidirection. It's just like a fuller, richer yeah. sort of sound. Um, and, and maybe too, because of the the backside being darker, they would probably face the front side towards the orchestra. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And yeah, and yeah. it would give it a certain yeah certain sound. Yeah, I mean, I I kind of grew up with Abbey Road, as it were. My first job was here, pretty much. Right. With, you know, from an 18 year old and. I kind of just took for granted the collection we have here at Microphones. Yeah. Because I remember um, like a couple of years later, I went to go and do a job at Olympic Studios. Yeah, another down in Barnes, yep. a great studio, yeah. yeah. Um, which someone told me they're gonna open up again recently. I, I heard that, cool. I saw, I saw um, some pictures about that. And I, I asked the studio manager to get the keys to the microphone room, and she was like, no, there's not a microphone room, there's a microphone cupboard. Open the microphone cupboard, I was like, oh, okay, so Great microphone collection, but I was like, hey, this is reality. You know, they had a couple sure. of 67s, I think they had one 47. But it was like a reality <laughs> check for me, because so I was spoiled. used to just having, yeah, it's spoiled, basically. Yeah, <laughs> right. I mean, we're so lucky here, we really are. So these are some of the modern mics. So these are actually mics we've designed with, uh, with, with Chandler. Chandler Limited, with Wade, yep. um, over in Iowa. Yep. Uh, so they're unusual mics. I mean, Wade always likes to kind of, you know, look at the old EMI gear and kind of, you know, add a slight modern twist on it, you know, yeah. kind of, or use the inspiration of that gear and those original schematics. Um, and, and we talked, just for people that don't know, yeah. uh, so we had talked earlier about Chandler making, remaking the Abbey Road, you know, preamps, yeah. compressors, yeah. Yeah. and that started 20 some odd years ago. Yeah. And he approached you guys. Yeah. To, to do that, and there's been a, a real synergy between you guys, and yeah. he's recreated these things, which is fantastic. Yeah, I mean, because I, that's, that's, I work closely with Wade, and, mm -hmm. and we kind of, you know, make these these beautiful bits of recording gear together. I mean, yeah. obviously, software's a big thing these days, yeah. you know, but people still kind of want real hardware, you know, stuff you can actually touch with your hands, and so uh, there's still a demand for that. Yeah, so Wade has been doing the, the mic and the compressors and the EQ recreations, and then it was like, well, you know, why don't we do microphones? What could we, yeah. what could we do with microphones? And Wade came up with this concept of, of uh, wiring the actual microphone capsule directly into the U47 preamp we talked about earlier on, right? Yeah, so yeah, the yeah. recreation of the U47 preamp, so you kind of got the mic and the preamp in the same in the same shell. So you can plug that directly into your door, into Pro Tools or Logic or whatever. Um, without, without needing a mic pre. Yeah, it's, um, so I don't think anyone done that, well, no one done it before, it's a patented design. Yeah. Uh, and another thing we did with the TG microphone was take the, so the transfer desk, which are essentially the mastering desks up in the mastering room, the EMI um, mastering desks, 
back then it was all tape they were working from. So they right. got these tape EQ selector curves for NAB or okay. IECs, um, 15 IPS, 30 IPS, 7.5 IPS, and they're slightly different EQ curves. And Wade and I always just love that EQ bump. I used to use it a lot for right. various bits and pieces. So we thought if we put that EQ selector on the back of the microphone, then you can you know, sculpt the sound of your microphone depending on what you're recording. So again, it's just a slightly different twist on the norm for microphones. So. Well, I love the fact that you guys have actually not only recreated things that, that are physical, but then you also have the, the plugins that you've done. Yeah, yeah. You did the collaboration with Waves. Yep. You've done different collaborations to capture all the different pieces of gear here yeah, in yeah. digital form, too. Yeah, and I, I, I just kind of feel that like it's great to have the, the plugins from the point of view, not only do they sound good, but also it kind of like it's telling the story, you know, it's keeping the Absolutely. legend alive. Like, you know, those, those classic designs, people like Mac, Mike Batchelor, Len Page, um, you know, they kind of, they're unique designs. And I love that the fact that when we release, a, whether it's a plugin or release a piece of hardware, we go back to the archives and we get up the old technical notes and there's photographs and we sort of tell that story and kind of keep that legend going. How involved is it, for example, when you model the echo chamber? Yeah. How involved is it to make these impulse responses or how, however it's done? Does this take a lot of time to do that? Yeah, I mean, a plug-in can generally take anything from six months to a couple of years. Okay. Depends on how much R&D okay, is involved. Okay, and who goes back and listens to make sure that they're right? That's me. <laughs> I was wondering, that's I figured, job. right. Yeah. And yeah. that's really difficult work, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, yeah, you, you, you can I mean, drive you, yourself crazy, right? You right. Sit, I sit there with a pair of headphones, right. um, and I've got the original gear, and I've got the software, and I'm sort of, I've used you know, drums, bass, vocals, strings, whatever, like a loads of different Yeah, materials. you put it through, you put like AB between the two. And you like ever ask anybody two. to come in, hey, come in, listen to this, oh, yeah, can and you tell the difference? So I do like the preliminary check, if you like, and yeah. then I ask the Abbey Road engineers to sort of, you know, double check me and make sure everyone's cool with it, yeah. and all that sort of stuff. So it's like a joint collaboration, but there's usually like, you know, a few back and forth before I get the engineers involved with the, whoever I'm working with, whether it's Wade or whether it's uh, the guys at, um, uh, waves or whether it's with Spitfire Audio with the samples. Yeah. Um, but yeah, eventually I get, I, I get signed off from the engineers. Which can, is, yeah. can I see the echo chamber? Yeah, let's go and check it out. Yeah, Great. yeah. Um, it's quite damp and smelly sometimes. That's all right. But, all right okay. There aren't a huge amount of echo chambers around no. anymore. I mean, we, we've got one. There used to be three. We've got one left. Yeah. Um, oh, there we go. I've hit something already. Um, this room's kind of interesting, actually. I've, I've seen people... I've, um, I've seen Paul McCartney do drums in here once, actually. Okay. <laughs> Which was like, I'd never seen it done before, but um, we were recording uh, Memory Almost Full. I was the assistant engineer on that mm -hmm. album. Uh, and, and Paul was like, you know, I want to record drums in here. And I was like, okay, we can, <laughs> I, think, I think we can do that. <laughs> Why not? Um, so we kind of dragged the mics in here and the microphone leads and all that sort of stuff. And uh, it, it's I mean, just sounded like brash, you know, yeah. and kind of cool. But the problem is, like, that just goes straight onto a neighbor's garden. So right. within like <laughs> right minutes, in. within minutes, security. Didn't appreciate that. Like getting com you know, oh complaints from the neighbors. Like, you'd think like, if you live next to Abbey Road that yeah, you'd be used to yeah, having some yeah. sound occasionally. So we try not to record in here too much, but it was kind of, I was a bit, you know, it's a bit nerve wracking to ask Paul to stop playing drums, but um, yeah. he got the take and it was, it was fine. But um, yeah, you know, it's, re we record anywhere at Abbey Road, you know, be creative with space. Wherever you need to. Stuff, okay, so yeah. this is it here? Uh, this is the chamber, yeah, at the okay. back here. What is, how many second reverb is in here typically? Oh, this is like zero point something or a bit yeah. short. Yeah, yeah. short. Um, but you know, we, we, we take digital reverbs for granted now. You yep. can have any space you want. But back in the 50s, you know, if you wanted to change the sound of your recording acoustically, the only way to do that was to actually take that recording and play it into another room and pick it up again, you know, play it for a speaker and pick it up with some microphones. Okay, so would you play it, would they play it through one speaker or yeah, two speakers? Yeah, so it'd be one speaker, generally where that speaker is now, sort of in the corner, so the sound would kind of hit the walls, bounce, bounce around back. the room. These are here to diffuse the sound. Diffuse these are, the these sound. are sewer pipes, yep. right? Yep. Um, and, Ceramic. And then two microphones at the back, well, it'd be one microphone originally, but now, okay. now two microphones at the back. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's this. But really, two microphones, it's not really in stereo, anyways. No, it's kind of, yeah, a <laughs> mishmash of yeah, reflections. But um, it's, it's, it's the bathroom, effectively. Like, it's you know, bathroom. That, that yeah. thing where people sing in the bathroom because right. it sounds good, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a bathroom. 
Um, but yeah, I mean, so the chambers were um, built in the early 50s um, by um, um, one of the uh, recording engineers. Is this an add-on? This looks like it's part of the original building. I think this used to be an air raid shelter. Okay. Or it was where the air raid shelter was. Okay. This is where they, they built the echo chamber. But yeah, Studio One, Studio Two, Studio Three, each had an echo chamber. This is the only one still here. Um, but then EMT plates came along in the late 50s, like 57. Yeah. Um, and I mean, again, we take this sort of thing for granted, but that was the first time recording engineers could actually change the the reverb the, time. That's right. You just hold a button down and it get bigger or smaller. They must that must be mind blowing. They must have freaked out. Yeah, yeah, because you can't do that with bricks and mortar. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, so, the, but the, the chamber continued to be used. Is um, this the only chamber in Abbey Road? It's the only one left, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, studio, did, every, did every studio have a chamber originally or not? Yeah, Studio One's echo chamber still exists, but ironically it holds the plate reverbs. Okay. So you can't reuse it as an echo chamber. And anymore. how many plate reverbs are there? We've got four here. Okay. Yeah. Um, and they are they all in that room? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, they're all in that room. But they're all they all go to every studio. Yeah. So we've got like a central patch room in the building. Okay. What if two people want to use a a, a plate well, at the same time? Fight in the corridor. Yeah. I, I, you book it out. That's the, I learned that right? lesson the hard way when I first started here. You book. Like, what am I hearing out. on that? Yeah. Um, actually, there <laughs> there have been instances where you kind of. Because you can patch this echo chamber into any of the other rooms. Okay. I do remember times when we were mixing in Studio 3 using this echo chamber, and if you turn the volume up, you could hear a band like basically next door, and it's all bleeding in here. So <laughs> just keep that down a bit. But you know, that's, that's bricks and mortar, isn't it? You know. Shall we take a look at some of the instruments? Yeah, let's check them out. So, I mean, this, this is the room that just keeps getting used, you know, by recently we've had Kenrick's Lamar here, Sam Smith. Um, Little Sims, it's, it's one of those rooms that people just want to, I get the impression it's one of those rooms that someone wants to, they yeah, want to do something they, in there at they some They want to get the magic. Yeah, they want to get in here at some point and do something in here. Yeah. Uh, I mean, when I was an assistant engineer here, I worked here with Nick here at Cave in the Bad Seas and Muse. Um, so yeah, it's just, it's, it's one of those rooms that just people keep gravitating towards. It's, yeah, it's a great room. Um, speaking of great rooms, we've got some great instruments as well. Uh, this is the Challen piano. Mm -hmm. um, these were kind of like songwriting pianos that were just kind of lying around in the mm -hmm. studios. Um, there were a lot of songwriting rooms here, so the idea being it's just a smaller piano that you could sit down and your vo vocal could sit over the top quite easily, instead of sitting there with a big grand piano. Um, so they weren't anything particularly special, but they ended up being used on some pretty special recordings. For example? Uh, Fool on the Hill piano, this okay. one. Yeah, um, and um, a lot of, yeah, a lot of uh, the White Album ended up using this Challen piano as well. These are just, these and things like the Celeste and, and the, um, the Hammond organ and uh, the Mrs. Mills piano, these are just instruments that were lying around, but those pop bands in the 60s were always striving to find new sounds. So they'd just, they'd use whatever was lying around just to get a different texture So this, this got used just because it was in this room, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and they say, oh, let's mic it up. Yeah, it's the, like, you know, it gives you a different palette to the grand piano, it's like a mellow sound. It is very mellow. Yeah. I mean, it's really beautiful. It's very dark. Cigarette burns all over it. There's yeah. chips in the keys, but that doesn't matter. It's all about the sound, right? The, the unusual sound, I guess. I mean, all these instruments have their own unique character. Um, same with any instruments, right? It's, it's something. Nice and these are all regularly tuned, right? Yeah, yeah. There's uh, there's a guy Banco who sort of comes around ever, once, you, a, once a week and okay. tunes all the pianos. Tunes for everything, us. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because there's a lot of pianos in this building, I bet. Yeah, there's one. There's a grand piano in each room, yep. and then a few of the uprights. Yeah. The Hammond here. Hammond RT3. Yep. Probably from the mid '50s, I think that was introduced. Um, that was used in a lot of Beatles sessions, Pink Floyd sessions. Um, I mean, it's just got this huge sound to it. You know, you've got yeah. the Leslie and you, you know, put two mics on the, on the, on the uh, rotary speaker and one on the How bottom. would you typically mic this? How would people mic this that you've seen in here? Uh, typically, it's like three microphones. You've got sort of left and the right on the top for the rotary speaker and then um, like something like a FET 47 down the bottom. Something for bass, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. And would they make it mono or would you put it in stereo? So, uh, normally stereo, but I guess, 
Back in the 60s, it would have been Be white mono. top mono, yeah. I would have thought. And then drums. Early sessions here, yeah. like rock and roll sessions, it would yeah. typically have been a mic on the top and a mic on the bass drum. Right. That was it. Okay. And then they started adding mics to the snare drum, okay. um, to the toms. So it kind of, you know, it got more complicated. So on Ringo's drum kit, you'd see uh, like a D20 on the kick drum, right? D20, D25. Yeah, what would D20 on the kick drum. Okay. And then a lot of times I'd see a, uh, the the what would it be, D19, the AKG? Yeah, it would have been um, the Coles 4038 would be early over, days, early and days. I think they, they switched over at some point to that D, the D19 microphone. Yeah, the thin, yeah. The, yeah, the small, small Yeah, one. they were like the workhorse microphones here at one yeah. point. Um, and then maybe like a KM54 underneath the snare drum. Okay. Um, probably similar on the toms. I mean, a really um, great techniques I've heard about over the years for those those pop sessions here, you know, during the 60s, the zombies and uh, the hollies and whatnot, is they put like tea towels over the drums oh, yeah. to sort of deaden the sound. Yeah. And even like gaffer tape of cigarette packet onto the snare drum. So when you hit the snare, it would open up and then close again and right. dampen it. So you kind of got that kind of bloom sort of thing, which I thought was quite, you know, pretty funky. Pretty inventive. Way of things. Very yeah. inventive. Shall we go upstairs and yeah, uh, yeah, take a check look? it out? Yeah. The original control room was that small booth just down there. Um, it was moved up here in the, in the late 50s. As the gear got more complicated, they needed more space in the control rooms. I would hate to carry, have to carry gear up these two flights here. You guys have <laughs> elevators here? There is an elevator. <laughs> Funnily enough, it wasn't installed until the 70s, I don't think. Uh, or early got, 80s, maybe. So before that, you to, wanted the uh, tape machine on the top floor. They used to lug it up the stairs. Oh my god, I can't even yeah, imagine that. crazy. I think a lot of people did their backs in, probably. <laughs> So here wow. we go, the control center. Wow. The, um, I think the orientation's changed over the years. Sure. I think, um, if you look at those 60s recordings, the desk is facing down there. Yep. I think 70s, the desk is over there. And, and now we're over here. Okay, so I want to ask you about a couple pieces of gear here. Sure. I see this Fairchild compressor that's yeah. down here. Yeah, yeah. Now, would that have been on Tomorrow Never Knows, for example, maybe? Yeah, well, the Fairchilds were used on a lot of Beatles recordings. Yes. Yeah. I mean, typically speaking... Like um, that exact one right there. Well, I don't know. We've we got like four or five in the building. It could have been that one, who knows. Um, but it's, yes, typically speaking, you know, the, the bus, the, the main bus mix out of the, out of the mixing consoles, the four tracks, Yeah. It, they would, like, you know, put the rhythm track through a compressor and that would usually be the Fairchild or the, the EMI RS-124. So yeah. yeah, a lot of those rhythm sounds like bass and drums, they would have all gone straight through a compressor like that Fairchild, yeah. It's, that's the sound. That's you know, the sound. Yeah, that's the sound, or part of the sound anyway. Yeah. It was an accumulation of things. Yeah, and we're lucky we still got this gear. Paul Tech EQs, yep. uh, the EMI compressors and EQs. Now those compressors and EQs, were they part of console before and they got re-racked here? That is part of the transfer console. Remember the, um, the EQ that's yes. on the Chandler microphone? Yes. So that's that transfer console. So that's bits of the transfer console. Okay. Each of the masking rooms still has an EMI um, e uh, e transfer desk in there, which okay. is kind of very unique. Yeah. It's part of the mastering sound here, if yeah, you yeah. like. Uh, but we've got the EMI TG desk okay, let's still talk here. About, let's talk about this This here. is the Mark II. So, so yeah, before, before this, um, all the desks at Abbey Road were, were Valve, built by EMI over yep. in the factories in Hayes. Um, and then in 1968, they came up with the first transistorized desks. So, and this would have been on Abbey Road? Yeah, so this was first used on the Abbey Road album and similar desks. Now, went. was Abbey Road 8-track done on 8-track? Yeah, 8-track. It's the only one, right? Everything else was done on 4-track? Bits of the White Album were done on 8-track. Okay. Uh, the story goes that, because there was always this thing here at Abbey Road, apparently, where gear would come in. So I mentioned the Fairchild. That was, came from the States. Okay. Um, the the um, RS-124 came from the States as well. It used to be an Altec compressor. What happened was this gear came over from the States because the engineers were always trying to chase that American sound or they would get um, correspondence with Capitol Studios and they'd sure. say, hey, we recommend this bit of gear. This gear would come over, but the way it worked here was that the technicians would get, give everything a thorough going over. They'd literally take it apart, check it all out, measure everything, make their notes to make sure <laughs> it was safe or right. it, was, it was like, you know, it met our standards, all that sort of right. stuff. So it's crazy. So. The reason I mentioned this for the 8-track, so 
it was a frustration, I think, of the bands here at the time because we weren't an eight-track studio. We right, and they knew track. that recordings in the United States were, were being made. Even other studios in London had eight-track, right? Oh. And, but we had an eight-track, but it was down in the amp room oh my God. being dissected by the technical engineers to make sure it was, you know, met our approval. But uh, I think it was um, Ken Scott and George Harrison who were working on the White Album they got on wind that this eight-track tape machine existed in the building somewhere. Right. And late at night, they went down and dragged it out, plugged it in, and used it. And I, I mean, I think Ken got a, a basically, yeah. So that, we're using this from now on, then. Yeah, we're using this from now on. But I think he got in a lot of trouble for it. But I guess it was the Beatles session. And so, what what else would have been recorded through this? What are some uh, of the other classic? The, uh, Pink Floyd, Dark Side of the Moon used. I've the, heard of not that this record. Particular one, but right. this this technology, this TNG yeah. technology. Yep. I think that when they went from. Valves to transistor, I think it was a bit of a problem from the point of view that it, it behaved differently, you know? Sure. So, yeah, yeah. So the engineers were used to like, you know, overdriving or pushing the valves on the red desks. When transistor came along, it sounded a lot cleaner and whatnot, but, but you couldn't push it as hard. So they had to rethink how they actually ran the sessions. So I yeah. think there was a bit of a transition period of not particularly favoring this at all. Right. But it's got a unique sound. All, you know, the red's got a great sound, but the TG also has a great sound as well. Um, and if you listen to like Abbey Road, it does sound very different to the other it Beatles does. albums. It sounds it a bit more polished, perhaps. Yeah. Uh, part of that can, you know, be down to the EMI TG desk, uh, and certainly if you listen to like Dark Side of the Moon, I mean that is just like such a, I don't know, it's like a, such a polished recording. Yes. Even to this day, it still sounds like perfect. In yes. A way. Um, there's a lot. Of, yes, that's the transistor sound, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Can we take a look at some of the other machines here? We got to. Yeah, we got, we, we, got got the, we got the red desk. Yep. Uh, I mean, these the red desk and the TG get used, like, you know. Still. Still. You yeah. know, I, um, I, the TG desk was used last week on a recording. People want that sound. Yeah. Like, we're kind of lucky here at Abbey we kind of got the best of old and new, if you like. So, you know, modern sound, Pro Tools, Ableton Live, Logic, whatever, and, and modern preamps and whatnot. But people still like to blend that with some of the older, funkier gear. It just gives you a different palette of sounds to yeah. play with, you know, sonic textures. So, so yeah, Red Desk from 1958. Uh, believe it or not, this was considered a mobile desk back okay. then. It sort of splits into three sections. Um, all valve, the whole thing is valve. The preamps, the, um, the, the output amps, the interamps, and the this whole is, thing. And this just, is hooked up right now and can be used. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's, this isn't like just here for show. It's, um, yeah, still used. Um, great EQs. I mean, I think it was Ken Scott who told me that they would just crank the high end and the, and the low end, just crank everything up. Um, and it, it does sound cool when you do that, yeah. Um, and this has been in this studio for for that long, or has this move, moved around? No, this was so, um, the original desks in here would have been the red, this was the first red desk, the yep. red 17. Yep. Then there was the red 37 and the red um, 51. The yep. 37 and 51 was what did a majority of the Beatles recording sessions. Yep. This was like generation before, um, but it's still kind of got that sound, you know, it's, yeah. But this is the this is the birth of the modern mixing console. I think this is the first console to have like faders. Yes. Yeah, so let's is, talk let's about take those. That for I mean, these now. are these are faders. Yeah. Most of the desks. Well, I'd say all desks before the Red Seventeen, everything was just like on dials. Yep. But um, someone came up with this concept of actually having faders, which is like that's all desks now have faders, right? All desks right? have faders. So yeah. It was kind they of have knobs too. Yeah, knobs to as well. Fair. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I, I don't want to. You know, <laughs> the knobs are cool. We don't want to diminish the. Uh, um, that, but. but yeah, uh, the kind of the first modern style mixing console. Also the first with, you know, got EQ on every channel. Yeah. Um, that was the big thing about the TG desk, actually. That had a compressor and limiter on every channel. Again, that's the norm with desks that's right. now. But back that then is. it wasn't. It was kind of new. Yeah. Um, tape machines, we got a, the J37 we were talking about, yep. which was the, the four-track workhorse. Um, these came to Abbey Road in 1964, but... Before that, they were using a, a Telefunken four-track tape machine. But that was a bigger, bigger beast to the point where it was housed in a separate room. Okay. So you'd have the tape op in one room and the band. And then and, that's and, when you'd be talking on the yeah, phone, you, right? Yeah, you can't run a session. It's like, drop in now, you know. It's like you've got, you've got a wall in between the communications. So, that, right. so when the J37s came along, they were smaller. They could actually get them in the control room. That, that changed a lot. It doesn't sound like it would, but it did change a lot because suddenly the bands, you know, were kind of using, starting to control the tape machine themselves, starting to manipulate yeah. the tape machine, like put their thumbs on the flanger and get that kind of flangey sort of sound, or yep. picking up the tape and turning it over and reversing stuff, um, ADT, playing with the, the speed of the tape machine. 
the tape machine became an instrument in its own right, yeah. you know, and that's yeah, yeah. because it was in the room with the band, with the producer, with the engineers. So the, you know, the Beatles did all this stuff. I suppose the like, I guess taking a tape machine, which was designed at the end of the day to record a sound as purely as possible, and right. abusing the facilities, like doing things with it, it wasn't designed to be done with, you know, that yeah. sort of thing. It's like breaking the rules and just you know experimenting. Where do you get tape for this now? It's <laughs> a very good question. <laughs> uh, I think there's like one, maybe two companies still that provide tape. Um, and how often does this get used? This th it gets used a lot. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna fire it up in a couple of weeks time actually um, for, a, for a little project. We've got when you've gone up. back and gone through all the old Beatles sessions, yeah. uh, would you use this machine or what? Yeah, yeah, and would yeah, you, yeah. Do you bake the tapes first or do you add? It's interesting you say that actually. So, the, so EMI used to make its own tape. I mean EMI used to make everything like yeah. radios, televisions, yeah. every, you name it. But they also used to make their own tape. Um, probably from, well, from when tape came to this country in the late 40s up until the late 70s. And, and EMI tape, EMI tape we call it, I don't know what they used to put in the, this stuff formula-wise, but it never needs to be baked, which is kind of alarming in a strange that's, sort that of way. That is really, so any, is really any, strange. So if you call up any master tape from the 60s, the 70s, it just plays. Whereas if you call up a tape from like 80s, 90s, even going like oh my back God. 10 if years I, ago. If I do from one from 10 years ago, you Yeah, it's just it. gunk on the heads yeah. and all that sort of stuff. Um, it doesn't need to be baked. I, well, how come I they dread... haven't figured this out? Well, it's, it's pretty like, like stuff you can't use anymore. In that that's tape. right. <laughs> it's pretty that, that's illegal, right. toxic, God knows. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's, it's funny you mention that. It never needs to be baked. Um, I've I got... always wondered that. I'm thinking, they can't be baking these tapes all the time when they're doing this. Yeah, I mean, the idea being is you, as you know, you know, you bake the tape, which is a, a temperature is about 15 degrees, if that, and over about a three day period. Yeah. The idea it, being it sort of it, firms everything up a bit. Yeah, reattach, make sure the oxides get reattached. Or yeah, and then it does. You've, you've got a window then of maybe like 24 hours to get yeah. that, that transferred into a digital format. So yeah. that's what generally happens when it goes back into the archives. I think you I mean, can, I mean, I think you can rebake. But everything has been, re has been transferred though. All, all the important there, tapes yeah. here is. Yeah, yeah. So you're not really going back and playing these things. N no, I mean, I do use Emmy tape though, because I there was a project I did. What was it? I think it was one of the plugins, um, or maybe one of the sample sessions we did with Native Instruments. But we wanted to use original Emmy tape because Emmy tape's got a certain sound to sure, it. Sure, absolutely. Um, and I think someone asked me, like, can you get any old blank Emmy tape? And I was like, I don't think so. I went to archives and said, no, we don't have any. And then I thought, well, you know, the amount of times you've probably done this, you record something on tape and you only use the first five minutes. That's right. So you might have 10 minutes of blank tape. Yeah. So I got permission, whoever granted permission back then, for me to go into archives. And I literally just like, you know, this, the, the archives is like um, that scene out of Raiders of the Lost Ark at the end, you know, it's this right. big cavernous room. And I just went along and sort of pulled the master tapes and said, okay, they only use five minutes of that one. I'd mark you it just up. Look, you just look on it and see yeah. how much, you know how much, how much time is on each reel. Yeah, so I'd cut the blank tape out. So I didn't affect the master. The right. master I'm not, I, I didn't go for anything big here. <laughs> I, didn't go, I didn't go through Pink Floyd you, master. Right? Needless I, to say, you've never heard of any of these artists. No, before. no, it was like, there's a lot of stuff in there you just, I've never heard of before. Anyway, not that right. there's anything wrong with that, but I just, I didn't go for anything. I didn't touch anything sensitive, put it yeah. that way. But I cut the blank tape out and yeah. now I've got reels of Emmy tape that we can use. Great. Um, which is kind of unusual. Yeah. So this is the, um, this is the BTR tape machine, which yep. stands for British Tape Recorder. Okay. Uh, Very creative. Yeah. The, so, Abbey Road, before the Second World War, was recording on still onto wax discs. Yep. Which was, I don't know, it's kind of crazy when you think about it, because you've got, I don't know, maybe like four minutes of recording on those discs, mm -hmm. and um, there was no, there's no way of editing. Right. Like, start or stop. Right. If someone made a mistake, you'd yeah. have to go over and over again. Um, so imagine recording like an opera under those conditions. Oh it must have been my, I think recording sessions back then, or I know recording sessions back then, were seen as a bit of an endurance test. Yeah. It wasn't a pleasurable experience. No. It was like, it was hardcore, you know? Sure. <laughs> so um, anyway, tape machines came along after the Second World War. Um, it was something along the lines of, um, it, we could, the kind of broadcasts throughout the war, you know, there was like the same message being broadcast in multiple different locations across Europe at really high quality. And it was a bit sort of, how are they doing that, you know? And it, it turned out that it, they had this, this technology called tape. Right. Um, which was, like, not only was it higher quality, but, um, but you could edit and all that sort of stuff. So, so when um, uh, I think EMI technicians went over to Berlin after the Second World War and kind of, you know, 
stole this technology effectively. Yeah, yeah. Took it back to the UK and um, EMI technicians were involved uh, and they backward engineered it and made the first tape machine in 1948, the, the British tape recorder, BTR1. Um, and that was a, I think that was a massive game changer because, yeah, as I mentioned, not only did it increase the fidelity, but you could you could edit, edit right? Yeah, you get a good section, you can, and you would just edit the master together. Yeah, so suddenly musicians were like, oh, like wow, we've got <laughs> there's some relief here, you yeah. know. Um, so I, it made the sessions more pleasurable. Like, sure. So it, it sounds like it's not a big deal, but it was a big deal. And I think that's the first instance of technology being used to augment the recording process. You know, we've, we've seen this all before, people criticizing computers being used, or people yep. criticizing all, things like auto-tune, or this is cheating, or that's cheating. But I mean, I would have thought there would have been people back then saying, well, that's not musicianship, you're cheating, you're editing, that's not a complete <laughs> musical take. Right. All that sort of stuff. I imagine, I don't know, I wasn't there, but that could be the case. Um, but and yeah. And this, this is in proper working order as well, right? Uh, not as well as the J37. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. A bit more hit and miss, this one. Right. Um, but these were the workhorse as well, I mean, um, they were used to do all the, then the first um, BTR was mono and then later they became stereo. But all the recordings were done on the mono um, BTR and then later they had twin track. So you record the band on one track and the vocals on another track, then stereo came along. But not only were they the main mix down machines, but they're also used to create sound effects. Okay. So you take signal from the J37 and uh, send it to the BTR and then play around with the vary speed and kind of get phasing, flanging, artificial um, double tracking. Yep. Um, and so they were kind of, again, tape machines weren't designed to do that, right? Tape machines were designed just to record music. These so were now the, being used as, as effects devices. Yeah, so a lot of the effects that the Beatles would have done would have been on with, a, with this machine yep. or machines like this, yep. correct? Yeah, these were the effect machines, yeah. Um, so again, it was a, using technology in ways it was never designed to be used. Right, it's fantastic. Which is kind of cool, you know? Yeah, it's very cool. So there it is. I finally made it to Studio Two at Abbey Road. I'd like to thank everybody at Abbey Road Studios, Merrick and the gang for inviting me and giving me such a great tour of the place. Remember to hit the subscribe button, leave a comment, let me know your thoughts. Thanks so much for watching.